Here we go. Let's get going, folks. I've seen a lot of familiar names there, and I'm glad you could all join us. Uh, uh, and we're here all to listen to Lorenzo Christoph talk about uh, community resilience uh, uh, energy. And um, he's clearly a, a recognized expert on that, as you'll find out. But just to give a little bit of background, I, I think you all know Lorenzo. So uh, uh, independent consultant working to design and transition to a decarbonized, decentralized, resilient, equitable, and customer-centered future electricity. From 99 to 2017, he is a principal in market design and infrastructure policy at the Cal ISO, where he led numerous policy initiatives, including design of the organization's nodal wholesale market and reform of transmission planning and generator interconnection policies. In the 90s, he worked at the CEC on California's uh, electricity industry restructuring. So uh, with that, I'm just going to turn it over to you, um, uh, Lorenzo, and uh, you were going to uh, make some statement about here. clarifying yeah. questions versus holding other questions at the end. I'm not going to do anything to mess around with anything. Yeah, thanks. So um, hi, everyone. Thanks for, for coming this evening. Good to be here. And thanks for the invitation, um, Alan and uh, Jim, to present here. Um, in general, I, my presentation should take about 40 minutes. If there are clarifying questions, things that you don't understand and it's bugging you if I keep talking, then feel free to put a note in the chat and Alan will be watching and will interrupt me. But in general, I uh, will have time for discussion after I finish the presentation. So let's save discussion questions for then if you don't mind. So the title here, Community Resilience and Community Energy for the 2020s and Beyond, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about are one, just what we mean by resilience, how energy is important to it, and also thinking about the future of electricity from the place where we are today, which is very much a legacy of the 20th century and where we need to go to deal with the challenges of the 21st century. So as a start, the context today, uh, a need for urgent action. So I think you probably all got the memo that the climate has been seriously disrupted as well as most of the ecosystems that we depend upon for life. And uh, it's likely to get worse in the coming decades. So um, that's something to, is really the, the, the dominant force in today's context, the impacts of climate and ecosystem disruption fall most heavily on vulnerable and frontline communities, but not exclusively. Uh, really, they tend to uh, affect everyone more or less. Um, there's still a prevalent belief among uh, uh, the billionaires in our, in our country and elsewhere that if you have enough money, you'll be fine, and maybe a few of them will. But for the most part, this is really uh, a situation that we're all having to deal with. And the, the crux for us in tonight's discussion is that energy systems, how we do energy, how humans do energy, how the industrial world does energy are a major cause of the disruption. At the same time, we can't just stop producing and consuming energy because almost everything we do requires it. So the question then is, what do we do? And I describe it as three major goals that are interrelated but distinct in parallel with urgency. Sustainability, for simplicity, I'm saying that means stop making things worse. Convert our energy practices to ones that are regenerative, that don't damage the environment, which usually means decarbonizing, getting away from things that generate carbon emissions, electrify things that are currently using fossil fuels and uh, imitate nature in a sense, the way natural systems work. They balance deficits and surpluses. They don't have waste. Uh, what can we learn from them when we think about the future of energy? And I think the answer is a lot. Second is resilience. And the distinction there is preparing for the impacts of damage already done. If we were to totally overhaul our energy practices tomorrow and stop burning fossil fuels, 
we still have set in motion climate impacts that are gonna play out over the next couple of decades. These are unavoidable. So we've gotta be prepared to uh, meet the challenges that are happening already today. They have been for the last several years. We've seen more extreme storms in different parts of the country, more extreme fires in California, et cetera. So that's the resilience is, is more of a, a, a near-term thing. Damages are having impacts right now. Sustainability is change everything for the long-term. And then finally, equity. This features a lot in uh, on the lips of policymakers, um, but it needs more definition in terms of what outcomes are we looking for. We use the phrase environmental justice, social justice, energy justice, equity. I'm not going to try and distinguish among those tonight, but basic elements are repair the past inequities. And we know that a lot of our energy practices have had uh, unfair impacts on certain populations, especially health impacts, where we locate fossil fuel facilities and how that damages people's health. And then also the issue of getting off of fossil fuels and what happens to the people who work in those industries. How do we have a just transition is the phrase as we retire these systems that are toxic, but we also need to care for the people. So it's those three big three, big, th big three things that have not really been on the horizon in the energy systems that evolved in the 20th century but are the most crucial and urgent right now. A little bit more about resilience. What does it mean? Well, for the impacts of the damage done, it, it, I, I tend to focus on the local ability to maintain essential quality of life functions and services when a severe stress or disruption occurs. And I emphasize local because even for a huge event that covers uh, a very large territory, it's all the local impacts that we need to be concerned about. It's people, communities, houses, um, and essential services. So uh, I'll expand this by saying, uh, one, climate-related disasters always have local impacts. What we need to do then, <clears throat> excuse me, when we think about resilience, <coughs> excuse me, let me just get a drink of water. Okay, sorry for the interruption. So what we need to do in thinking about resilience then at the local level is have preparations for how do we ensure the continuation of water supply? How do we provide shelter for people who are driven out of their homes because they have no uh, electricity? In Texas in February a year ago, there was a major freeze and a couple of hundred people died because they lost power and it was freezing and they had no place to go. You know, so part of this is gonna be about places for people to go where they can get shelter, food, medical care, et cetera. So all of these things need preparations for losing power from the grid. And then more generally, as communities reduce our dependence on macro systems and supply chains, we've learned a lot about supply chains in the case of COVID in the early days, being able to get protective equipment, uh, collaborate with neighbors to strengthen community self-reliance, support local businesses and local media. So in a way it's our dependence on these global and national macro systems that make us vulnerable. Um, Energy resilience is a crucial part of community resilience because all of these crucial activities need energy in some form. If we're going to pump water, uh, shelter people, provide heat or cooling, et cetera, uh, we need energy and the power grid is like, likely to fail. And so the energy resilience conversation is really focusing on how do we prepare when the grid goes down? And the main strategy are different variations on microgrids. And what that means is you create a facility with a local electricity system, typically solar and battery storage. It could be wind, it could be thermal storage. There are a lot of different combinations, but the idea 
is that the local system can function and provide electricity even when it's disconnected from the grid or when the utility grid goes down. Variations on that, a resilience hub is typically a single building microgrid. You might take a community center uh, like um, Vets Memorial in Davis, or we were talking with the folks who are developing the um, Cape Bay Valley Health and Community Center in Esparto. You could take that single facility and enable it to have independent power supply. And uh, I, I also want to emphasize that we want to do this with clean energy, not with fossil fuels. What we've seen in California over the last several years because of the power shutoffs by the utilities that an awful lot of people invested in backup generators that burn diesel fuel or that burn gas. And uh, those are of course uh, disadvantage disadvantageous in two ways. One is when they run, they create pollution, but two, they don't run most of the time. They just sit there as idle assets that have no value. When you build a microgrid using clean energy, using solar, using storage, you have a resource that's good 365 days of the year and is providing power and reducing electricity bills. So doing this with clean renewable energy is of course the best way. And then there's the idea of a community microgrid and that's where you have a small network that may be multiple buildings and multiple resources that are all in a, in a contiguous area, maybe on a single electricity circuit. But the bottom line here is that community energy resilience requires new energy policies. And I'll explain that a little bit more, but the notion is that the structure we have, the regulatory structure, the monopoly utilities, the statutes at the state level, um, and the way electricity functions has all been around centralized, top-down, centrally controlled and planned. And the policy framework doesn't quite know how to adapt to enable local energy resources and community resilience. A little bit more on the resilience topic, I like to use the analogy of nature. How does nature design resilience into complex living systems? And I use the term architecture, Na nature's layered architecture of resilience. And you'll see what I mean by layered. A single cell is in itself a complex living system. Uh, it's got a lot of things going on. It's got its energy supply. It's got a membrane with which it interacts with the outside world. It takes in information. It responds to that. So no doubt a complex living system. But for the most part, cells don't exist all by themselves. They exist in the context of some larger functional entity. If we think of a living uh, organism, complex um, a, mam a mammal, the, the cell may be a muscle cell that's in your heart. It could be any kind of cell that's in your body, but the point is that it, it has its own integrity as an individual cell, but it also serves a larger function of which it's a part. And then extend that, the heart is an organ inside a human body. So the heart has its function that it performs, but it performs that in conjunction with other systems that make up the whole body. Go the next level, and uh, each of us as an individual is not a completely isolated, independent individual, even though uh, many people like to think of it as being you know, self-made man or self-made woman, um, but we exist in communities, we exist in families, we exist in different levels of organization in which we participate, and then you can take this all the way up to the entire globe. So you can think each of these as layers of complex organization from the cell all the way up through the levels up to the whole system. At each level, it's a complex living system. And if you ask, where do we need resilience? The answer is everywhere. Each, each entity or each level of uh, each layer of this structure needs to have capability of being resilient. That is the ability to respond and maintain essential functions when disruptive events happen. Here's one of my favorite models of a community microgrid. This is the idea of using an urban city block. This model was created uh, 
for Oakland in a, in a, a low income neighborhood. It's a work in progress right now. It's under construction. The idea is that you unify the whole block electrically so that everybody's on the same circuits. You put solar panels in the best solar exposure areas and then you have centralized energy storage, could be batteries, could be flywheels. Um, here's some of the properties down the left-hand side. You integrate it with broadband telecommunications. You can do food production in the local area. You contour the ground to capture storm water. So it becomes a little integrated, resilient community system. What I love about it is that this model could be something we replicate in urban residential areas all over the country because they all have blocks that look like this. The, the grid work is, uh, is, is the kind of the national model of urban development. So you can replicate this everywhere. Um, the project was developed by UC Berkeley and the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in uh, under a CEC grant. They're now in the second phase of that grant, which is implementation. The problem is it's just a demo project and the statutes on the, on the books in the state and the regulatory framework and the utility model and rules, they really inhibit the commercial viability of doing this. They make it very expensive. So without a big grant from the Energy Commission, you can't do it. And the things that you could do to make it better are prohibited by law. So you can't just replicate this elsewhere, not for technical reasons. Technically, it's by and large good to go, but for institutional reasons. So that's why I mentioned earlier, we need new policies to enable community energy resilience. The politics behind this, and this is playing out nationally and even globally, because wherever there are large scale power systems with big generators and high voltage transmission, the, the distributed resource technologies that enable local power systems, they're basically the same everywhere. The technological evolution is the same. The laws of physics are the same. So it becomes um, a bit of a political context contest between the incumbent entities who have a lot of political power, who have been doing business a certain way for 100 years. For 100 years, if you wanted electricity, you really got it from the grid. That was the only place for most customers, besides little things like flashlight batteries and car batteries. Almost everybody depended on the grid. The goals in the 20th century, as we built up the system starting in the 1930s, 20s, 30s, and then especially after World War II, was a massive buildup of the grid. We were building industry, we were building suburbia, we were spreading out and increasing population and we needed electricity. So it was all about building grid, grid infrastructure. And in order to do that, the model gave the regulated utility investors uh, very nice, comfortable, low risk returns. Those have endured to this day. And so you can imagine the idea of building a lot of assets and getting a guaranteed rate of return of 10 or 12% is something that none of them wanna give up. The regulatory commissions like the Public Utilities Commission in California, basically their role has been to protect the regulated monopoly from competition. Yeah, they do sort of watch out for some of the worst abuses to make sure that they're not gouging customers. But even that is breaking down, as we've seen in California, that many of the wildfires have been attributed to lack of appropriate maintenance on facilities by uh, the utilities. So the, the regulated oversight of them is declining in, in functionality, um, but they're still being protected from competition. So this structure was created 100 years ago. It's not changed a whole lot. And it was made for a centralized top-down power supply model. Where we're going now, 21st century, the new goals, decarbonization, resilience, energy justice, these were not on the radar in the 20th century. So we really need to reach the system, need to operate in order to serve these new goals. And then the new technologies, of course, are enabling all of this. Distributed energy resources, or DER, that's the industry buzzword for basically everything that's 
small scale, scalable. It could be uh, it could be connected to the utility grid. It could be on site on the premises of industrial or commercial or residential customers. An individual house can have solar panels and battery storage and be a microgrid, have the ability to island. Many of those exist and many people are investing in them already. But the, the key point for from the policy perspective is that the grid has serious competition right now. People can decide to install on-site equipment and just leave the grid. And the interesting thing that's happening in terms of the economics of energy is that the costs of the grid are going up. We're seeing that in California, the rates are going to be going up to a large extent due to building expensive infrastructure and due to wildfire liability costs being passed on to ratepayers. Um, at the same time that these DER technologies are getting cheaper, more powerful, more scalable. So the idea of using on-site distributed resources, they're gonna substitute for grid energy in almost any application. So it becomes easier for customers to want to adopt them. And they're better able to support local resilience, equity, and decarbonization. And why do I say that? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, resilience really is a local attribute. Everywhere that even a, a broad disaster that covers a huge territory, it still impacts people where they live, and that's where we need to build resilience. Energy equity, I'll come back to that in a moment, but the, the decentralization of the ownership of the assets is a huge contribution potentially to equity, where you can have community level co-ops, local government agencies, different forms of community-based organizations that actually own local resources that generate revenue for the community. And when we think about decarbonization, a lot of that is going to be accomplished through local government initiatives. Think about uh, a city that has a fleet of 50 buses and they want to electrify those buses. Well, the best thing to do may be to build vehicle charging stations for the buses that have solar and battery storage so that as you're decarbonizing, the, elect, the fleet, you're actually supplying the electricity locally. So it's a win-win in many ways. But the initiatives for this really will come to a large extent from cities because they, do, they deal with things like housing density and what kinds of developments do they approve and zoning and building codes. It's those kinds of initiatives that I think will, will have a huge impact on decarbonization. But the crux of it then is, DERs enable local ownership. They offset the need for grid infrastructure, which puts them squarely at odds with the 20th century profit model and regulatory structures, which were designed for centralized ownership and building lots of big infrastructure. And so a lot of the politics, most of the politics that you see around electricity today comes down to this really crucial uh, controversy. So a little bit about what a 21st century decentralized electricity system could look like, starting with the notion of community level DER based systems supported by state policy. I use the phrase bottom up meets top down because we want the initiatives to come from the bottom up. We want local governments, communities, neighborhoods to determine what their needs are, but then we need the state to enable this by getting rid of the, the uh, statutes and the regulations that are barriers and change the framework so that it is welcoming and facilitative of local resources. The, the trend I mentioned is that DERs grow more cost effective, the grid gets more expensive, it's still vulnerable, customers are adopting these things. There was an article several months back about people who own uh, luxury mansions in California, 14,000 square foot homes, and they're investing in microgrids on their homes. And when interviewed, they say, oh, we don't care about return on investment. We just wanna make sure we have good power all the time. So parties that have the money can do this. And, and the problem then is that if it's affluent customers and commercial and industrial customers that are the only ones who are able to do this, then we end up worsening the inequities in society 
rather than improving them, which is why my advocacy about policy is to enable all communities to have access to these alternatives. Some additional characteristics, as we think about the grid of the future, I'm not saying that the bulk power system, that is the utility scale resources and the high voltage transmission will go away. I think it's more like a 50-50 type arrangement where we'll build a lot of local resources and we'll be able to uh, use them in an economic fashion to provide services to the grid to offset grid infrastructure investments, but we'll also still rely on the bulk power system. When we think about large scale decarbonization, there are valuable wind resources in some of the northern states in the West, like Wyoming and South Dakota. There's, there's a really uh, high quality solar resources in the Southwest, and much of the resources are not close to load centers where the population is. Now, there's environmental issues with those. We clearly don't want to overbuild those as, as well. But I think for at least the next decade or two or three, we'll see a balance between bulk system resources and local resources. The problem in the political realm is that the people who want to build the big infrastructure really want to prevent the distributed resources from having any impact so that they can build more. So we need to direct state and federal resilience funding towards these local initiatives, build resilient local power systems, retrofit existing buildings. We, we know that buildings in California, uh, especially the old uh, existing legacy building stock, a lot of it is very energy inefficient and an investment in that could really aid decarbonization simply by reducing demand. And then these local facilities, microgrids, or what are called smart buildings, where a building can actually interact with the grid and provide grid services so that it doesn't have adverse impacts. Islanded operation, that's the term for when a microgrid separates and operates completely independent of the grid. These are all things that are techni technically within our grasp. Um, Enact a community bill of rights. This is something I've been talking about with some colleagues as, as a foundation really for state energy policy. Uh, it, it hasn't seen light of day in the legislature yet, but we're talking about the idea that every local government, every tribe, every community has the right to develop and implement its own local energy systems to provide for their electricity needs. And we need then a framework in the utility structure that enables communities to do that. So build local capacity, fund and support communities to design and deploy local resources. If we think about communities and local governments investing in energy resources, one of the challenges is that they don't have energy expertise on their staff. They don't have even bandwidth to think about designing energy projects. They need help at the state level. I'll come back to that in a moment because there's some legislation I'm working on that will, that will help to remedy that. But the idea is that communities can't just dive in and say, okay, here's my energy project. Here's what I want to do. It's going to take some capacity building. And then finally, um, and this is a big one that, um, that my own interest, uh, my own activity has been focused on a lot for several years now, is to reform the regulated monopolies so that as a distribution network, they're providing a network service where all of these distributed resources can interact, can provide services, can trade excess energy when they have it, and can get income from those uh, transactions on the system, but we need uh, a distribution network that enables that. And right now that's not the utilities mandate. Their mandate is to be the exclusive provider of service uh, for which they wanna build a lot of infrastructure. So there's a lot of conversations going on among different entities and even at the Public Utilities Commission on this question, unclear where it will go, but I've been a very active ad advocate in that sphere. So the policy vision, I think that um, a great idea would to, at a national level, and this could be part of uh, an infrastructure bill. I think the one that passed doesn't have a whole lot about local resources 
but who knows what may happen in the in the uh, next round if there's uh, a better majority in the legis in the Congress. National nationwide deployment of fossil free distributed resources, microgrids, energy efficiency retrofits, and then dynamic load management. That is, how can we control the uses of electricity in a way that's largely invisible to the customers that need electricity, but can have a, a beneficial impact on the grid by shifting the load to times when uh, it has less impact. So um, a top-down, a bottom-up meets top-down policy framework. Democratizing energy is a buzzword that a lot of people are talking about. What do we mean by democratizing it? Well, I think of it in terms of some very basic ideas, communities identifying what their needs and priorities are. What are their, who are their most vulnerable populations? What are the services that they're most likely to see uh, um, impeded if there's a disastrous impact of some sort? What sort of things are they vulnerable to? And that depends on where they're located. What climate zone are they in? Are they near the ocean? Are they near the mountains? Are they in an earthquake zone? Are they subject to hurricanes? They'll all be different. So we want the communities to identify what their needs and risks and priorities are. Then it's also being able to make energy supply decisions, making choices about what kinds of facilities they want to supply their electricity needs, and then owning and operating uh, energy, local energy systems. The technologies are not just about decentralizing the physical assets, but decentralizing the ownership. And those assets generate revenues. And local ownership then keeps a lot of the revenues in the local community have voice in regulatory proceedings. That's a very difficult one. At the Public Utilities Commission, there are dozens of siloed proceedings that all are interrelated in many ways. They touch on some of the same issues, but they're in regulatory silos. So you think about community-based organizations, communities that don't have the ability to hire uh, expensive lawyers and consultants and policy experts uh, you can say, well, they're invited to come to the proceedings, but they don't really have the capacity to participate. So these are the things that need to be beefed up through state policy. Um, and then we need state to invest in these things to really empower the, the local aspect of this. Second big theme here, oh, uh, some, some specifics now. I said I was going to mention legislation. So Senate Bill 833, our Bill Dodd, Community Energy Resilience Act. This is coming back for the third time this year, gaining momentum. The first time was in 2020. And of course, um, the onset of COVID really sabotaged the legislative agenda so that a whole lot of bills had to be pulled and everybody's uh, portfolio was reduced. But the Energy Resilience Act uh, empowers communities to plan for resilience and design shovel-ready projects. It basically would create a program under the California Energy Commission that and funding that would give grants and would give technical expertise and pre-qualify a stable of consultants that could help these, custom, these communities do energy planning. So it's only the planning part. It gets you up to having a shovel-ready project proposal. Then AB 2667 by Friedman, that's called Integrated Distributed Energy Resource Fund. That's actually big funding uh, up to around a billion dollars for building the local energy systems that are designed under 833. Uh, there is some money going out already under the Strategic Growth Council. There's, they have something called Transformative Climate Communities. That's about $100 million. And that's open for applications right now. You can go to SGC and Google TCC and you can get the details on that. Um, but that's not the end of it. That's that, that those applications close on July 1st and then awards will be after that. But there will be other tranches of money from the state because with the budget surplus that uh, was realized this year, last year and this year, there are a lot of people coming with proposals to do things. And there's a lot of concern about local resilience now. You have uh, environmental justice groups and um, uh, environmental groups and local community, uh, community-based organizations that are starting to 
form coalitions and go to lobby for money that says, look, don't just give a gazillion dollars to the utilities to underground lines, give it to the communities to build facilities that will supply power when the grid goes down. Because we know that no matter uh, how many billions we invest in strengthening the grid, there will be times when it fails. And some regulatory proceedings that you may be interested in, I've given you the docket numbers, you can look those up. The high DER future, I mentioned that a moment ago, they're looking at ways to think about reforming the distribution utility. It's a long, slow process. It's just getting started. It's gonna run for three years. So no quick action coming out of it, but at least they're starting the conversation. And I and many of my colleagues will be in there advocating for good ideas. The CEC is opening up a process in parallel to the CEC one, and they're trying to think more bigger picture about California's ener energy future and the importance of distributed resources. This hasn't gotten started yet. In March, they adopted what they call an OII, an order in initiating investigation. I think that's what that stands for. So it's got a docket number but they, they haven't started actual activity. They'll have a workshop, I think, around the beginning of June to kick that off. The CPUC has the net energy meeting, metering proceeding. Probably most of you know about that. It was hugely controversial when they came out with a proposed decision in December that would have slapped gigantic fees on rooftop solar. In January, with a new chair of the commission, they uh, and a statement from the governor that it needs more work. They chose not to vote on the proposed decision. They pulled it from consideration. And since the end of January, they've gone into some seclusion, I guess, because nothing is coming out publicly about what they're thinking about, not even a timetable of when they might have another proposed decision. So we don't know what's going on, but I have seen that dozens of parties are requesting ex parte meetings. Ex parte are the, the, the meetings that, that you have that you have to publicly announce if you're uh, uh, an independent group and you're going in to talk to the commissioners. So everybody's going in to talk to them, but there's nothing coming out of them thus far. Um, and then also at the CPUC, there's a microgrids proceeding that was uh, set up in 2019 that um, that was a response to legislative direction that was passed in 2018, Senate Bill 1339. Uh, Scott Weiner was the lead uh, senator on that. And that basically directs the uh, Public Utilities Commission to enable commercialization of microgrids. So the proceedings been running since the end of 2019. The pro progress in it has been rather tiny and it's still going on and it's also hugely complicated. But uh, you know, if you're into following proceedings and wanna see more about it, you can go to the CPUC website and plug in those R numbers and you'll get a whole page of all the documents in there. Um, so policies, here's kind of the, the philosophical uh, approach to policy rather than specific. One is view distributed resources as, as key to the clean energy future, not just a problem. And that I think ought to be obvious to all of us after this conversation. But in fact, when you look at the way the legislature and the utilities and the Public Utilities Commission think about distributed resources, it's all framed as a problem. They're disrupting the usual way of operating. They're disrupting the revenue stream. They're disrupting our business models. They're disrupting the regular. So it's all caged in terms of disruption. And that, that may not be immediately obvious, but it does play to the revenue model of the utilities because when you're looking at worst case scenarios, then you're gonna build more capacity. It allows you to overbuild capacity because you say, gee, all these people are putting on rooftop solar and they're pumping energy into the grid or they're, all the people in this community have electric vehicles and they all come home at six o'clock and charge them at the same time. We've got to build a lot more grid capacity. The alternative that we're trying to advocate is, no, let's look at ways to incentivize coordinating the activities of these facilities. Let's 
maximize the value of the facilities by using them as an alternative to building infrastructure. So it goes to this bottom up again, start with the needs of customers and communities, drive DER growth from the bottom up, and then utilize them in a way that uh, offsets, that, that minimizes the problems they cause and offsets the needs to build capacity. The next philosophical piece, but that really needs to be made practical, is compensate the, the resources for providing grid services. And then there are entities called aggregators where individual vehicle charging stations say, might not do much as individuals, but you can coordinate the activity of 50 of them and you can have a grid impact. So uh, that's a possibility, but we need to create the framework that enables that. If you can pay for grid services, That'll help defray the costs uh, of the investment by the customers and the communities, but it also then helps align the private investment with the operational needs so that we flatten the load profiles. A lot of what drives grid uh, investment and grid costs is the load profile over 24 hours. That is, has a, has a, sh a, a shape with a, a bump in the uh, morning and then a big bump at night and then with a lot of solar, a big belly in the middle of the day. So it's a very extreme 24-hour uh, load shape. And if you have to plan the grid to accommodate all of that, you're building too much infrastructure, which is not used most of the time, but you need it for that late afternoon. Well, then the use of distributed resources, the logic here is let's flatten these load profiles. Let's bring down the peaks. Let's bring up the belly by storing the excess storage. So all of these things are technically feasible. We need the rules change to enable them to happen. And then the final piece here, redefine the distribution utility. The term I use is an open access distribution system operator, but recognize that it's got to operate a network, which is now going to accommodate all of these resources that are owned by customers and communities based on the principle of natural monopoly. The utility should not be doing things that are competitive. They shouldn't be uh, building vehicle charging stations. Those technologies ought to be a competitive marketplace. As we see in California, for example, with community choice aggregation, Valley Clean Energy, they are providing retail electricity in competition to the utility. So that there's no reason for the utility to do that at all. It's a competitive activity that should be unbundled. Some other things that ought to be unbundled uh, are, well, one, the utility's business model is capital investment. They get a nice generous rate of return for building and owning assets. We want to compensate them based on performance. How good a job do they do in interconnecting community resources, in providing information to communities to design resources and rewarding them for providing grid services. All of those things are part of the performance of how good a job the distribution utility is doing. And then finally, something else we're advocating is separate out the data management piece of this. The meter data that the utilities collect from customers, they view that as a competitive asset and they hold on to it religiously and prevent people who need it from getting it. Uh, any of the CCAs can talk to you about that. They'd like to get the meter data on a daily basis, which the utilities could very easily provide. They collect it, they validate it, they aggregate it as needed, they could easily send it to the CCAs and they just don't do it because they view it as a competitive asset and it's not in their uh, best interest to try and help the CCAs be successful. So part of what we need to unbundle is the, the meter data aspect and make that available on a non-discriminatory basis to everybody who needs it. So back to now community resilience. So, so just to wind things up, the idea here being the, the layered model that I talked about at the beginning, the layered architecture, the same thing applies to communities. And this little concentric circle is a visual way to represent it. But I put just some ideas here. How can we be more resilient at the household level? And I've listed a bunch of things, minimizing waste, gray water recycling, low water landscapes, physical and mental health, energy efficiency, consume less stuff. At the neighborhood level, what can we do within a few blocks radius? We can be producing food. We can have 
chicken coops that we are that are shared. We can share cars and tools. We can have public spaces in every neighborhood where we get out and we have birthday parties and we meet and talk about important things with our neighbors. We can do community energy projects, of course, free cycle rainwater capture. We should be balancing solar PV with tree canopy. Don't just put solar on every roof to meet the needs of the house. Plan solar so that you're using the areas that have solar exposure, but you're still enabling tree canopy to be healthy and houses that have shady roofs still get solar energy. They just don't have it on their own roof. We move a level up to the municipality level. Well, that's where um, municipal services become important, water supply and, and sewer. Um, those are the things that are most vulnerable to a major outage, but also public spaces, local businesses, uh, uh, municipal level activities for repairing and repurposing goods rather than sending stuff to the dump. And of course, public transportation, transparency and participation. Uh, move up another level, another layer, county or and bioregion, multi-county bioregion. We can be planning food and waste management and water management and, and having, um, having wildlife habitat restoration and so on that serves a larger community area. And then finally at the state level is, is enabling all of these things to happen. Uh, energy justice is important because if we just go up to the level of the municipality, we know that there are wealthy ones that will do fine and others that will be left behind. So the state really needs to be have a role in making sure that no communities are left behind and that we remedy the past inequities by strengthening them. Final, final slide, energy democracy and resilience require a new economics. And, and this is really bigger picture, the economics paradigm we've been living on under for decades. It basically emphasizes more of everything, more consumption, more growth, more profits, more waste. This is the antithesis of decarbonization. It's the antithesis of sustainability. It's based on the doctrine that consuming more makes us better off. And I call it a doctrine because it's been inculcated in us for a hundred years through advertising. Buy more stuff, that's what will make you happy. The more economy, and here's sort of the sinister part of it, the more economy artificially lowers prices, even though we're seeing prices going up now with inflation, in many ways, those prices are artificially low for just about everything, especially true for energy. Why? Because we're externalizing a lot of the costs. As long as we can exploit cheap labor, as long as we can exploit the environment by dumping toxics, those are costs that ought to be in the prices of things. And by excluding those costs, the prices are artificially low. And what does that do? It encourages more consumption than we would consume if the prices reflected all the true costs. So how do we rethink economics? An idea that I like a lot is donut economics. Many of you may know about this. Uh, developed over the last 10 years or so. Kate Rayworth is uh, from England. She wrote the book and uh, there's a good website on it. Um, many cities are adopting donut economics as a way to think about the economy. The idea being that you define a zone in that green area where you have, you're staying within your ecological limits and you're providing socially for the needs of everybody. So on the inside where you have the red areas or the pink areas, that's where there's shortages. Some communities are struggling for sufficient food or don't have health care or don't have clean water supply or don't have sufficient housing. All of these things where there's deficiencies in that interior zone, the economy is failing to provide for the needs of people. When you go to the outside, that's where we're overshooting all of the ecological limits. And it's not just climate change, ocean acidification, all kinds of pollution, um, air pollution, biodiversity loss, uh, et cetera. All of those things are overshoot. So let's start to structure our economic thinking as reducing or eliminating the overshoot, reducing or eliminating all of the shortfalls for communities and populations that are disadvantaged. And then finally, a quote from one of my uh, early mentors from the 70s and early 80s, in order to change an existing paradigm, 
You don't struggle to try and change the problematic model. You create a new model and make the old one obsolete. I think that's where we all need to go. And that's the end. I will stop share at this point so we can all be on visual together. There we go. Uh, questions? Well, I'll start off with one. Um, I got my hand up. There you go. I'm sorry. Take it away. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether that's what we were supposed to do, whether we we're supposed to raise our hands to indicate questions. So my name is Christine Schumacher and I, I live in Woodland. And the question I have for Lorenzo kind of focuses down on what he was talking about at the beginning, microgrids, the sort of individual microgrids versus the community microgrids. And it seems to me that the community microgrids would be really, really powerful versus the, a lot of individual ones. So if you were to imagine in, in Woodland that the, the, um, the junior college and the high school, which are close enough, what would it take legislatively or regulatorily to allow that to be a community microgrid? Same way in Davis, your memorial auditorium and your library or near one another. What would it take to allow to have community microgrids? Well, one of the biggest impediments is that there's a section of the public utility code section 218, which defines what a public utility is. And it's also sometimes called the over the fence rule. If you have two physically adjacent properties, one property can serve electricity over the fence to the adjacent one. But anything beyond that, if you cross a public right of way, if you try to connect more than two customers, then you become a public utility and you're subject to the regulation of the Public Utilities Commission, which slaps all sorts of requirements on you. So one of the efforts that many of my colleagues are working on now is to create exemptions from the PU code section 218. That's one of the problems. Um, the second one is that if you serve multiple customers that are on, say, a distribution circuit, that circuit belongs to the utility. It's their property. So in order to be able to function as a microgrid and serve multiple customers, you need some sort of a collaborative relationship with the utility. And right now, the utilities are not into collaborative relationships, although they might talk that way. They are into relationships where they're completely in control. A good example is the Redwood Coast microgrid, which is kind of the first of its kind. It's up in Humboldt, where there's an airport and a Coast Guard air station and uh, about 20 other customers, and then some community scale solar and battery storage. And they're all on the same circuits and they can operate as a microgrid and separate from the grid if the grid power goes out. But in order for all of those different entities to be part of the same system, part of the same microgrid system, you're using the utility wires. And so the utility steps in and says, well, we have to be in complete control of this. And they become the exclusive controlling entity. What many of my colleagues are doing, there's a group called Microgrid Resources Coalition, which is an activist group in, in many states, but especially in California, they're trying to establish the ability for a third party to operate a microgrid where the utility is just providing its wires as a service. But that's not where the utilities and the commission want to go. So that's, that's kind of a heavy lift. So these are some of the barriers that are just left over from the utility monopoly framework that um, and the regulatory framework that need to be changed. Yeah, so thank you, because I really think community microgrids would be a powerful thing for resilience. Thank oh, you. it is. And there's lots of people thinking about how to do that. The Redwood Coast one is, <laughs> is a good example from a technical perspective, but it really doesn't provide as much value to the community as it could. 
if we could solve this utility problem. Now, a third, a third workaround, if you, if you wanted to get into this, is the idea of municipalizing. There is a statute on micro utilities that would say, well, we want to form this community microgrid. We've got 30 customers and we've got a grocery store and a community center. They're all on the same circuit. Let's just take over the utility wires so that we can run it as a third party. And there is a micro utility statute that enables that, but it's really a high hurdle to be able to do that. If you try to take over utility facilities, um, that's usually called condemnation. We discussed that in Davis back around 2014 or 15, and it's just a really high hurdle to be able to do that. Uh, and the utilities, they just, you know, they have armies of lawyers and they just throw gazillions of dollars and they take years to do anything and they make it really slow and painful. So there aren't really good answers without getting more of a political constituency to say, yes. we need to do this because our communities need it and we need to loosen up the rules. Okay, thank you. I have a question, Lorenzo. Um, uh, Lorenzo, I've got a couple of questions for you. And, and as I was following your presentation, <clears throat> it seemed to me, and, and you just touched on this, that until we replace the investor owned utility model with something closer to uh, a true public utility such as SMUD, uh, we're going to run into these continuous political and regulatory roadblocks. They're going to claim, oh my gosh, you pull out of our system. Uh, we have stranded assets. We, we have to be compensated. Um, they will use every mechanism in the book. And we could see back in the day when the proposal was to move uh, SMUD over to Yolo County, so we'd be brought in under it. Um, and of course, it's not legal to do this, I don't believe anymore, but there was a tremendous amount of advertising weight yep. thrown against that and it, and of course it failed so i guess my other question is in relative to the um eco block model um do you think that'll form a template that then could be replicated in terms of design and management expertise and and solving some of the problems that they're having to solve there on the block uh, level in oakland where that could be dropped into other cities uh almost as a a lot of the a lot of the tough work has been done on it on it and uh uh i guess my third question would be are they are they coupled to the grid to 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 account for certain uh let's say uh yeah. load increases and things like that so may, maybe i'm asking too many questions at no once. that's fine that's fine and i see that jim zanetto put a question in the chat as well talk more about oakland eco block he asks how are electrical energy costs handled where some properties have PV panels and others have none? So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. I'll start with your last question, really, because EcoBlock, uh, I loved it when I first learned about it because it seems to me that it is a replicable model that you could build in urban residential areas everywhere. You know, it's really ideal for that. Um, and um, it's it's really getting the the regulatory and statutory barriers out of the way. That's that's the big problem right now. To Jim's question, um, the the idea is um, that you form some sort of a, a, a an actual organization, a membership organization of all the buildings, and the membership organization. It could be like a, a, a homeowners association in a way. Um, and, and that organization would be the entity that's the uh, manager and administrator of the eco block for that block. And so, you know, it would have a budget and it would have to compensate if people have rooftop solar and they're putting energy into the system, they get compensated for the energy that they put in. People don't have rooftop solar, they're taking energy out of the system. They pay for the energy that they get so that the whole thing balances out. But it's a it's a cooperative community enterprise with a, a formal legal structure that that has to balance its books. Um, and uh, in terms of interconnection to the grid, the eco block has a single point of interconnection. They call it a point of common coupling where it meets the utility grid. So in the future that we're imagining, the eco block as as a 
community microgrid can still be providing excess energy to the grid sometimes and selling it, getting paid for it. And then sometimes it needs to consume from the grid and it's paying for that. It can also provide grid services. It, it can be, um, say, flattening the load so that its interface with the grid doesn't have a high peak. Um, it can be providing things like voltage support and offset a need for infrastructure. So it's really the, the other part of the microgrid is we, we reform the utility network so it becomes a, a network for parties to transact and the microgrid transacts in that system. But it has a single point of common coupling where the islanding takes place. When the grid goes down, it wants to operate. And this is all very smooth from a technical perspective. It's like flipping a switch. It goes into isolated mode now, and then it can go back when the grid comes back. So technically all of this stuff is possible, um, but um, it requires this framework that removes the barriers and also the opportunities to participate in, in remunerative services. Um, and then your first question about municipal utility like SMUD, the, certainly there's good reasons to want to do that, but it doesn't completely solve the problem because one of the problems is that the way we pay for infrastructure is through volumetric rates. This is what came up in the NEM debate. And SMUD worries about that too. You know, if a whole lot of customers put on rooftop solar and solar with battery storage and they're consuming less from the grid, well, SMUD's business model is also a problem right. because they're relying on volumetric rates to pay their assets. Electric co-ops are doing the same thing. So, I'm, so they're all vulnerable to that. So municipalization is not sufficient. We really need to rethink the revenue model. How do we recover the costs of the distribution utility? What services does it provide? Who should, who's getting those services? How much should they pay for them? And really rethink the, 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 the value proposition of the distribution network and how to price and pay for the services that it provides. And that's why even in talking about net energy metering, it's a hugely controversial thing. And the solar industry is on one side saying, don't kill NEM and the PUC and the utilities and most of the legislature wants to kill it. And from my perspective, NEM is still a silo issue. You know, it's just looking at one piece of a larger picture, and we really need to reform the larger picture, which is changing the definition of the distribution utility. What's it supposed to do? What functions does it provide? What services does it provide? How does it get compensated? And put it in this bigger context of we want to have a higher, more, more distributed resources. We want more community energy. We want more microgrids for resilience. We want more local ownership. How do we redefine the utility to accommodate that future? And then the question of the NEM tariff is a piece of that bigger picture, but it's not an answer in itself. I think I answered all your questions, did yeah. I? Yes, you did. You covered them all. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> I have a, a question, uh, Lorenzo. What's the yes. Utilities Commission uh, in Davis doing? I, I heard you uh, haven't been following it, but I, I thought you were uh, trying to advance some proposals to the, the council. Yeah, so... Um... The Utilities Commission has been interested in resilience. We formed a resilience subcommittee, which includes me and Elaine uh, Roberts Musser and Steve Gellin. And we wrote a letter to the city council saying that we would like them to initiate a resilience hub project for Davis. And that is through some kind of public process and investigation, come up with what would be a good site for a resilience hub that is some kind of a single facility. Single facility microgrids are a lot easier to implement than community uh -huh. microgrids. So it's not that big a deal. I mean, it's, it, you have to spend some money and there's some technical issues, but the, the regulatory challenge to just putting something on one site behind a single meter is a lot simpler. 
So we could take an existing facility, perhaps Vets Memorial, and then just equip it with solar and storage, or perhaps somewhere else. In any event, we, uh, we proposed to City Council that we would like them to open an initiative on this. We heard from both Dan and Lucas that it's an interesting idea, um, but it seems like they're, they want to wait until the Climate Action Adaptation Plan is finalized before they make any decisions about specific projects. That's the sense that I got. So it's kind of uh, on hold for the moment. We may think about going back to them again and uh, arranging to do a presentation at a council meeting and so on, but uh, we've been met with silence. Is there anything in the, the cap that's going to come out that would potentially be conflicting with a, a microgrid facility in, in Davis or, or do you get the sense that it's... No, uh, I don't think it's conflicting. What I think is, is uh, at least the rationale is that you want to look at the whole package of needs and prioritize among them and allocate available funds to in the best way. Hmm. And if you just do a one-off thing and give it a bunch of money, then it kind of takes it out of the prioritization exercise. So there is some logic to waiting for that. The concern, of course, is that uh, every fire season gets worse. And um, you know we need to move to implementing stuff and not just doing more reports. So we'll see, uh, we'll, we'll have another conversation at the next Utilities Commission meeting and see if we want to uh, uh, do some further outreach to the City Council. I have one quick question. Who is Sierra Club Yolana Group? What's your name? It's the Sierra Club Yolana Group. That's our local- No, but I mean, uh, who are you personally? Who am I? I'm Alan Pryor. I'm the chair of the Sierra Club Yolanda Group. Okay, so you're both, uh, you're you're on there twice. I have two screens, right. Okay, I, that, I set it up. Through the, sorry, through the, I was anyway. just trying to figure out who, who the voice belonged to. Thank you. Yeah. And then it looks like Jim has his hand up. Jim Kramer? Yes. Um, when you're talking about sort of the redefining things, the big picture and so on, is that essentially uh, analogous to treating the grid like the highway system, where it's uh, more like a government structure and not a private enterprise for profit system? Um, in some ways, yes, um, because it will have a public service mission, which it goes beyond simply generating profits. Um, but at this point, um, I'm I don't want to exclude the possibility that the existing utilities could be reformed to play that role, because I think there's a lot of progress we could make with some changes to their roles and responsibilities, some changes to some of the statutory rules that govern their behavior that could enable them to be more supportive of local energy than they are today without going to a complete public takeover. So I'd like to see some changes that, that help um, facilitate microgrids in the next year or two, uh, whereas something like a complete public takeover, I think is gonna be a much more severe long-term battle. It was clear when PG&E went into bankruptcy in 2019, there were some really good proposals put on the table. Sam Licardo, the mayor of San Jose, led a group of cities that put a public entity proposal on the table for PG&E. They got no traction. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that had to do with Governor Newsom. He basically sponsored or he instigated legislation that set a very tight timeline to get PG&E out of bankruptcy and settle its liability issues and create a statewide fund and in order for all of that to work, it had to be completely wrapped up and finalized by June of 2020. And, uh, and so that timeline kind of torpedoed any serious consideration of alternatives. So it would be very hard to find the political will for that sort of thing uh, in the near term. It may be easier with all the pressure coming from local governments, from community organizations, environmental justice groups, and the state 
has been talking about equity and environmental justice a lot. It needs to, it needs to show up with something concrete. So that's sort of how I'm approaching it. What are, what are the changes we can make that enable some good things to go forward? Other questions, folks? Uh, yeah, I have another quick one for you, Lorenzo. You didn't talk about um, digital or information security, which it seems to me would be easier to implement if you made the impose the cellular model and you and you made the you made the uh, the problem of providing of energy services much more granular and localized, yeah. and with a large uh, centralized grid, which everyone always speculates is extremely vulnerable to uh, hacking and digital disruption from some uh, malefactor. Is that is that something that comes into the discussion here? I haven't seen it mentioned on your slides. Um, You're right, that's that's a valid point. I, I haven't talked about it much because it's kind of a big can of worms and a lot of people have different opinions about it. But the idea that I introduced of layered architecture, where you know you have the bulk power system operating its system, and then you have the distribution utility operating its system, and then you have a microgrid operating its system, and you have the ability for all of these systems to operate separately, detached from the grid, that kind of layering pre can prevent any kind of a cyber attack from uh, proliferating through the system. And, and that's really, when right. you look back historically at the big grid outages, going all the way back to 1965 in New York and New England states, and then there were more recent ones um, in the Midwest going east in 2004 and others, they propagate, those outages can propagate from one location over a very large area. So right. the ability to separate out and, and segment the grid is, is definitely a strategy for greater security. Right. Well, what struck me too, when you're talking about, when you're talking about hidden subsidies and that sort of thing, the transportation grid, as it were, the highway, the street and highway system, which everybody assumes is a public responsibility that we can get around uh, on a federal, state and local level is the biggest most massive subsidy to uh, automobiles, the automobile industry that could ever be envisioned. And if you if you looked at energy, the energy transmission problem the same way, mm -hmm. that it was a common responsibility, you'd remove all of this, uh, uh, many of the problems that we have to face today in terms of energy transmission and PG&E poles and wires and substations and that sort of thing. Uh, and it's certainly a capital intensive business, but so is, I mean, what good is having a brand new car if you have no place to drive it? And we rely on the feds and we rely on the state to take care of that for us. Right. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there are, there are definitely ways to improve the economics so that it's more beneficial to the public. This hundred year old model of building assets and getting a guaranteed rate of return um, right. has ended up like in many of our industries, it ends up gaining a lot of political support because they funnel it into political campaign contributions and so on. And, and uh, they also have armies of consultants and lawyers that can dominate every proceeding. So, so my last question, my last question is, how optimistic are you that we're going to see some meaningful transition here in, the, in this infrastructure? Well, um, I try to avoid things like optimism and pessimism. Um, I feel like there's a lot of work to be done that um, I contributed my fair share to burning fossil fuels in my life. I don't wanna leave it to the younger generation. Um, and there's lots of good people trying to make good changes. I have a lot of co co colleagues and allies that I work with, you know? So my, my favorite metaphor really for the work I'm doing is, um, those little shoots of grass and weeds that grow up through the cracks in the asphalt after a rain, you know, uh, would you say they're optimistic? It's, it's kind of irrelevant. It's, it's, they grow because that's what life wants them to do. 
And, yeah. and I think it's kind of the same thing. You know, we need to engage in these systems that life and communities depend on and make them better in whatever ways we can. Well, thank you very much. Very informative, well, Lorenzo. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay, I put it in the chat. I don't know if it's showing up because I didn't see uh, Jim's comment in there, but if- uh, Oh, no, again, Jim, Jim Zanetto just commented directly to me. That's why you didn't oh, see it. There. Okay, well, I just put in the chat that uh, we are recording this. I have no idea the size it's gone on for an hour and 20 minutes, so I think it'll be substantial. But if uh, you want copies of the recording, email me at Sierra Club Yolano Group at gmail.com. Or maybe you and, can post it somewhere. Maybe, you know, yeah. do you have a website or post it on Cool Davis' website? Uh, uh, um, well, we can do that too. Yeah. Yeah, that makes and, it easier. And my email is on the is on the slide deck and at the last page. So if you all have any follow-up questions, feel free to email me. Uh, Lorenzo, will you make the uh, slide deck available or is that integrated into the um, into the video itself? Well, that... Alan has the slide deck. He can he can send it around. I'll be happy to uh, send that directly to you. That's a, a modest size. So uh, just shoot me an email. I can get that to you right away. Thanks, Alan. Lorenzo, I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing on this. Um, I mean, not just communicating to us, but all of the background work and lobbying with CPUC. Um, let us know uh, any way that we can help you. Okay. By us, well, I mean individuals, but also Yolano Group and so on. Well, for sure, um, you know, get in touch with Bill Dodd's office and Cecilia's office and support these bills. That That's one thing that's, that's helpful. And um, any opportunities, uh, I, I'm sure that campaign stuff will come up in the governor's campaign. Um, you know, tell them to make the world safe, to make California safe for community energy. Any opportunities that you have. Sierra Club uh, California is very involved in these proceedings as well. So if you are in contact with the, the whatever is the state office, um, there are some folks in the Bay Area office that are actually actively engaged. Um, you can talk with some of them as well. Yeah, the, the, the Sierra Club Energy Climate Committee uh, seems to be uh, pushing in a, in a very consistent direction with what you're talking about. Yeah, certainly the folks that I'm, uh, I'm working with uh, out of the uh, East Bay office, um, we're collaborating right. quite closely. <clears throat> Good. So thank you, Lorenzo. You're thank welcome. You, Lorenzo. Thank very you very good much. job. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a great evening.